Welcome to Stanton Alliance. My name is Brendan. As you may have noticed, it's Palm Sunday. It's glad, I'm very glad to have you all here this morning. It is good to get together and fellowship with each other and to worship God together this morning. And to remember uh, what Palm Sunday is about. I have a couple, actually three announcements. The good news is, is they all involve food. Tonight is the Youth Spaghetti Dinner. This is their fundraising uh, by donation for uh, their missions trip this summer to the Twin Cities. And this is an opportunity to come out and support them uh, in their efforts to get to know the youth better. They'll be putting on some skits and to have a time of fellowship with each other. Plus, you don't need to cook. The youth are doing that. Um, then Friday, we have a Good Friday service here. This will be a time to gather together and reflect and partake in communion together. We're going to consider... Jesus' suffering and what he did for us. We're going to consider why he had to suffer, why our sins brought him here to earth to die for us. And we also need to consider why on earth do we call this ugly day good? And there is hope in that term that we call Good Friday good. Then on Sunday, a week from today, we'll have our Easter service here at our regular time, 9.30. Please come, bring your friends. It'll be a time of celebration because Jesus is risen. And we will have immediately after a, a brunch together. Today you're being fed by the youth. Next week it's your opportunity to feed everybody else. So if you can sign up, it would be great if you're willing to bring some food. We'll have brunch immediately after the service and a time of fellowship there. If you're new to our church, we have a connect card we'd love for you guys to fill out um, to help us connect with you, get to know more about you. Um, and Help us be able to get you information about our church and events that are coming up. Uh, feel free to fill that out, and there's um, a place in the back you can put that. This morning, we're going to look at the New City Catechism for our call to worship. Question number 11 this week says, What does God require in the 6th, 7th, and 8th commandments? Sounds like a short question. It's got a longer answer. But I can see somebody coming up to Moses and saying, Whoa, Moses, 8 commandments. I was lost at number one. No other gods before me? That's going to take me the rest of my life to figure out. What's with eight? And Moses comes back and says, no, no, these are easy. They're short. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Don't kill anybody. How hard can that be? Most of us could raise our hands this morning and say that we haven't killed anybody this morning yet. We haven't committed adultery this morning. We haven't stolen anything this morning yet. Most of us haven't had any time to. But we cannot consider these commandments without looking at what Jesus said about these commandments. If you remember from Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, You've heard that the ancients were told, You shall not commit murder. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty. Well, that adds a whole other dimension. And on top of that, he says just a few verses later, And I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's what do not murder means? That's hard. He says, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery. That's hard. That adds a whole other level to this. It takes it inside. It's not just an external thing. Let's look at the answer for number six first, and we can read this together. Sixth, that we do not hurt or hate or be hostile to our neighbor, but be patient and peaceful, pursuing even our enemies with love. Wow, we're going to stop there. I, that, that, that's too much to get over. Can anybody here do that perfectly? Perfectly all the time? No. This is requiring a heart change. Let's look at number seven. Seventh, that we abstain from sexual immorality and live purely and faithfully, whether in marriage or single life, avoiding all impure actions, looks, words, thoughts or desires, and whatever might lead to them. Thoughts? We have to control our thoughts too? Moses, this is too much. Jesus, this is too much. Who can do this? And lastly, eighth, that we do not take without permission that which belongs to someone else, nor withhold any good from someone we might benefit. All right, withholding good. Ah, I don't know that I can do that. This requires a heart change. This requires putting others before ourselves. Pastor Page is going to preach this morning from Psalm 110, which talks about Jesus coming as a king with a rod of iron. 
and he is going to make sure that all this happens. Well, I can't face up to that. But Jesus also comes, and this is prophesied in 110, Psalm 110, that Jesus comes as our high priest. And as we celebrate this Good Friday, Jesus died because we can't do this. We're not perfect. We can't accomplish this. Jesus died for us to make it so that we can stand before God and say, I'm unclean, but Christ's blood covers me. Amen. Let's look at the verse for this. Oh, looking at at, uh, Romans 13, 9 here, reminds us that these commandments are not the greatest commandments. The Ten Commandments are negative commandments. But elsewhere in Scripture, it is outlined what the greatest and second greatest commandment is. Let's read this, and this is a positive commandment. Romans 13, 9, together, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the positive form of the commandment, loving your neighbor as yourself. If you do that, you won't steal from them, you won't kill them, and you won't commit adultery nor will you covet, nor will you dishonor your father and mother. That's what the second greatest commandment says, and it sums up the the second half of the Ten Commandments. Let's gather together in prayer before we enter our worship in song. Father, thank you for being our God. Thank you for sending Jesus, humble and riding on a donkey. The people of Jerusalem welcomed him with glad cries, and sadly, the story goes on to say that it, sh- that it was shown that they did not welcome him into their hearts, but only into their city. And later they kicked him out and killed him outside the city. I pray that we will take heed from the warnings in Scripture, that we will welcome Jesus into our hearts and let him be Lord of our hearts, Lord of our lives. Help us to submit to his authority and help us in love in response to the love that he has shown us, that you have shown us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Watch over our time this morning. May it be a blessing to you, our praise and our worship to you. I pray that it will also be a blessing to each one here. Help us to learn, help us to grow, help us to be your children in humility. In Jesus' name, amen. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, Tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble and riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heavens. The entire city in Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this? He asked. And the crowds replied, It's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Stand and join us as we worship. Let's stay.
Hallelujah.
Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you. Thank you for your name, God. Thank you for the beautiful example that you gave to us, Lord. The beautiful example that you are to us, God. We thank you that we can just wonder in all of your glory, God. We thank you that there is no limit, nor there is no end. God, we thank you for your power and how you've used it, God, for our good. God, as we listen to your word this morning, as we continue to worship you, Father, just impress that on our hearts. Help us to be grateful and thankful, Lord, that you came prepared for what you needed to do for our sake. Lord, we're thankful for that this morning. Thank you for all this in your name, Jesus. 
The word of the Lord from Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments from the womb of the morning. The dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Matthew 22, verses 41 through 46. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David, in the spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word. Nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray for our kids as we uh, send them to their kids in praise time. If you kids would stand. Father in heaven, we thank you for our children. We thank you, Lord, that... Jesus, you pay attention to children, and we thank you that you love them. And Lord, as a church, we want to love them well. We would ask, Lord, that you would bless them as they go to their time and their study, that you'd give them wisdom, insight, and understanding. Give them eyes to see and ears to hear, and a heart that might respond in faith, trust, and obedience. Bless our teachers, give them grace. Give them the ability that they need to teach, not in their own wisdom, but in the Spirit of God through the Word of God. And Lord, as we study this passage this morning here in our time, we ask that you would grace us with your presence. We thank you that you have said that whenever two or three gather together in my name, there am I and they're in your midst. And so, Jesus, we thank you that you're here. We would ask, Lord, that you would give us understanding, that you would help us to come with expectant hearts. We pray that for ourselves, Lord, you would give us eyes to see the truth, ears to hear, and a heart that would respond in faith and trust and obedience. Guard us, guide us, fill us, teach us, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. I hope that um, you can take your Bibles and open to both um, Psalm 110 And then also Matthew chapter 22. Before I get started, there's a few things that I'd like to mention. First of all, uh, just a word of encouragement for you to be remembering to pray for Ted and Marjorie Klein. Many of you know them. They have been longtime members of this church uh, and, of course, still are a part of our church family, though they're not able to be here on a regular basis uh, as many of you know, they're continuing to decline, and, and uh, Ted has recently been um, admitted to the health care unit of where they're living and will not be able to return to uh, their uh, independent living situation. And so, of course, this is putting a lot of stress on both of them. So please remember to pray for them, and if you are moved by God to give them a phone call, I'm sure that they would certainly appreciate that. Second thing I'd like to do is to congratulate uh, the uh, Van Dyke family who found out this week that their little boy, uh, Caden, has been officially uh, given to them as their adopted son. And so, (laughs) praise God for that. Many of you have prayed over this situation, and God has answered. Amen? Amen. Uh, Third thing is to uh, bring you up on an update. Um, Many of you saw in the email that was sent out this week that Helen Wilson, who was also a longtime 
a member of this church passed away on uh, uh, about 3.20 on Thursday or Friday morning, I guess it would have been. Uh, this happened very quickly. Um, she just found out uh, really in the week prior that she had stomach cancer and um, elected not to do the surgery uh, that um, they discussed. There were some real complications in that, and so the family decided not to do that. And I was with Helen uh, several different times, and um, they are having a family graveside service tomorrow at 2 o'clock. There will not be a funeral uh, but I do know that uh, her so uh, daughter, Teresa, and son, Brian, whom some of you do know, would appreciate their, your prayers for them and well wishes as they go through this time. Helen was very ready to be in the Lord's presence, and so she's there. Amen. I'd like to uh, bring us this morning, we completed last week our study in First Peter, and today is Palm Sunday, as you can see the palms in our hands as, one, as, the, as well as those that were read about as Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem uh, on this very important Sunday, or very important uh, day. And so I'd like us to consider this morning a passage of scripture that I suspect that for, for many of us is maybe not all that familiar with. Uh, and so I want to bring this uh, to you. Many of you have read the stories, the, the children's stories of C.S. Lewis and the Narnia series. And in the second book, The Lion and the Witch and the Wardrobe, there are four children and they find themselves entering the world of Narnia, a world that they'd never uh, known, a, a world that was new to them. And in the course of that story, they meet Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. And Mr. and Mrs. Beaver are so, so very excited to meet these four children because they, uh, they know that there's something significant about the fact that these four children, these sons of Adam, as they call them, and daughters of Eve, uh, have entered the world of Narnia, and there's a significance to the fact that they're there. And so Mr. and Mrs. Beaver are talking about with great excitement about the fact that uh, these four uh, children have showed up because uh, for them, they understand that there's a storyline that's happening in the world of Narnia. Of course, the children themselves are very uh, unaware. They don't understand the significance of their being in Narnia, and they're quite lost as to all the things that are going on. And at one point, Mr. Beaver says... And if you bring, but for those of you who know, think back, you can even hear it from the uh, a movie that was made. You don't know the prophecy, he says. And so he explains to them that when two sons of Adam and two daughters of Eve come and sit on the four thrones at Care Paravel, then the, uh, the reign of the witch will end and she, her, the time of evil will be over. And I suspect that for many of us, I think we're a lot like those children. We don't know the storyline, and we've forgotten the prophecy or the words, the prophetic word that was given to us in this particular passage of Scripture. Let me ask you this. If I were to ask you, and I am asking you right now, uh, what is the most famous psalm? in the Psalter, which one, one or ones would you point to? Any ideas? 23rd. Any others? Two? One, what? 119? Okay. Any 110s? <laughs> no. But did you know that the New Testament writers quote Psalm 110 more than any other chapter in the Old Testament? They thought that Psalm 110 was absolutely critical to understand all that Jesus was doing and who he was and what he was doing. They quote it over 20 times, direct quotes from Psalm 110. Jesus, as we're going to see in a minute ago, picked up Psalm 110 in his ministry on that final week, we're going to talk about what he has to say about it. Peter used Psalm 110 in his sermon on Pentecost Day. And of course, the book of Hebrews picks up Psalm 110 and camps out there over and over again. The writer of Hebrews brings Psalm 110 to, a, to our attention. It's a very important psalm, but we, like the Pevensey kids, 
have forgotten its prophetic word. And so I hope this morning to be able to bring to us a little bit better understanding of why Psalm 10 was so important in its significance to Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, as you know, was the day in which Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem. It's a very important day, but I suspect for us uh, Gentiles living uh, 2,000 plus years after the event, we, we, it, the, the weight and the significance of the event doesn't really hit home to us. But for the people of, of Jerusalem of that day, great excitement at Jesus coming to Jerusalem on Passover week. And he comes to the city in a most unusual way. He doesn't walk in as everybody else is doing. Rather, he rides into the city. To the shouts and to the adulation and, 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 the, and the excitement of many crowds who are lifting up branches and waving their arms and screaming and, 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 and at the top of their lungs, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Can you feel a little bit of the energy, of the hope? of the anticipation of what was about to transpire, as least, as, at least as they thought it would be. And clearly, Jesus is making a very bold statement. He is claiming unequivocally, openly, to be the king, the great son of David. Up until this point, Jesus has been very reluctant to do anything of the sort, Think back about how he treated when people, when, when demons would come out, I know who you are, and he would keep them quiet. Or other cases where people wanted to come and take him by force and make him king, he dismissed the crowd after the feeding of the 5,000. He would stay out in remote places and, and, and teach, and he wouldn't go into the cities. He was very reluctant. But on this day, not so. Jesus comes into the city making a very bold claim that the king had come. It's hard to know exactly all that was on Jesus' mind, all the thoughts and feelings that would have been present in him as he knew what he was coming into, what city he was coming into, and what was going to transpire in the coming days. But I know at least two things were on his mind, and that's the reason why we want to look at Psalm 110. We want to ask the question, what does it mean that Jesus is king? What does that mean in Jesus' mind? What does that mean for the scriptures themselves? And what does it mean for you, and what does it mean for me? I hope the key truth that we can grasp this morning is simply this, that Jesus is the true king who comes to be the forever priest. Jesus is the true king who comes to be the forever priest. Let's look at that first one. Jesus is the true king, or another way to say it would be Jesus comes as king of all. Jesus comes into the city of Jerusalem, and several things happen. First is the triumphal entry. He enters into the city to the praises, to the shouts, to the, to the anticipation of the crowd, all ready to crown him king. Immediately, he moves from the entry right into the temple, and he cleans it out, and he says after driving out everyone who's selling and, and doing business, he says, my house shall be a house of prayer. Every day in the coming days of that week, in Passion Week, he teaches in the temple. And because he's teaching, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the priests and the scribes, all the leaders of Israel begin to ask him questions, and they actually ask him four questions, and this is in Matthew chapter 21 and 22. First, they come to him and they say, by what authority are you doing these things? Then they ask him a question about taxes. Should we pay taxes or not? 
Then they ask him a question about the resurrection. What about the resurrection? And they tried to set up a scenario that he would be caught in. And then they question about the greatest commandment. Which is the greatest commandment? All the while hoping that Jesus will say something either stupid or silly and become the derision of the people or that somehow he might alienate one group against another. Of course, at every turn, Jesus answers with wisdom and discernment and understanding, and they have nothing by which to ground their accusations on. But then Jesus turns the tables. He has a question of his own that he brings to them. And this question is to get at the identity, his identity, and force these people, the leaders of the people of Israel, as well as the crowds who are listening in, to make a decision about him. He asks them in chapter 22 of, of Matthew, he asks them this question, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And of course, Jesus knows that they have a particular view on who the, the, the Messiah, uh, the, uh, the, who the Messiah is and whose son he will be. And they answer according to their view, he's the son of David. And of course, that's not altogether incorrect. In fact, there's lots of places in the Old Testament, many passages, that clearly state that anointed and an anointed descendant of David would come and would sit on David's throne and become a mighty deliverer. Their view, their understanding of the Messiah would be that this son of David would be just like David. He would be a national leader, a charismatic leader. He would be a political leader. He would be a military leader. And he would deliver Israel from their enemies. And he would usher in a golden age for the people of Israel. That was their concept. That was their idea. And it was also not only their conceptual idea of what the Messiah would, would be and do, but it also it was the extent to which they thought he would go. This was the kind of Messiah that they conceived of, and it was the kind of Messiah that they desired. Jesus, though, challenges them to think about the Scriptures to take hold of a prophecy, a, the words of, of, the, uh, of the prophet David, of, the, of David himself, and think about what David said about the Messiah. And so he asks them a, a question. How is it then that David, in the spirit, now when he says in the spirit, he means David writing according to, to the, to the will and direction of the Holy Spirit. How is it then David, the king, the king himself that you, that you long for, calls him the Messiah Lord, saying, Psalm 110, verse uh, right there at the very beginning of the, of the psalm, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Here's Jesus' question. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? Now you have to track, you have to think, you have to understand what Jesus is pointing at. Just this. If the Messiah is just David's descendant, then why would David, the king of Israel, call him Lord? You see, David is calling someone who is separate from Yahweh, the God of Israel, Lord. Do you see the conundrum Jesus is raising for these Jewish leaders. Who 
could that possibly be? How is it that David, who is the king of Israel, says, speaking to the Lord, the God of Israel, says to my Lord. Now, who is this other person? Who is this other Lord that David is speaking about? And that's the conundrum, the, the, the challenge that Jesus is raising for the, these leaders. Who would God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, be speaking to and calling that individual Lord? And not only calling him Lord but then saying, sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies your, under, uh, uh, your, enemies your footstool. See, what, De what Jesus is pushing on these leaders is saying, it cannot possibly be merely one of David's human sons. This individual is not God. Yahweh, but nevertheless is equal with God. He's sitting level with him. Get it? Do you see the conundrum? They're caught in a situation. And here's what Jesus is driving at with these religious leaders. He's saying to them, you have a view of the Messiah. And it's not, to, not altogether wrong, but it's too simplistic. It's too inadequate. It doesn't take into account all that the Scripture has to say on this particular subject. And Jesus is pointing out to them that psalm that they, like the Pevensey children, were ignorant of and hadn't thought through. You've missed something vital. And because of that, you are missing a piece about the Messiah that's absolutely critical if you're going to understand who he is and what he came to do. And so Jesus is showing them from the scripture the word concerning himself, concerning this prophecy that they had forgotten about or had not thought deeply enough about. And so Jesus is inviting them inviting these leaders to think out the implications of what this text actually says. And not only to think it out, but Jesus is forcing the issue with them so that they will be required, they will be forced to make a decision about himself. And I want to point out to us this morning that there are two implications from this. The first implication is if Jesus is merely the son of David as they understood it, then all he could ever do would be to bring the kind of Messiah that they would like. If Jesus is only a son of David as a descendant, he could only bring the kind of kingdom that that, Messiah, or that uh, son could bring. Understand? If he's just a son of David, he's going to bring a kingdom like David. It'll be national, it'll be political, it'll be military, it will be earthly. If that's all he is. On the other hand, if the Messiah is not just the son of David, but also his Lord, then he is going to bring something far greater than David, David's kingdom ever hoped to be. He will bring a much greater kind of kingdom. One of our commentators puts it this way. Jesus does not simply extend the work of David, but, become, but comes to establish a wholly different kingdom, the throne of which is situated at God's right hand. It is thus the question it is thus the question of another kind of fulfillment for the promise that that which contemporary Judaism ever expected, the political nationalistic concept of the messianic mission, 
supported by the scribes is simplistic. The other implication to this understanding is that the leaders of Israel had a box. And inside that box, they had placed the Messiah that they desired. And Jesus is here to destroy the box. Jesus is blowing up their box because they have a concept, a conceptual idea of what the Messiah would be like. And he is challenging that their concept is altogether inadequate. And I'd like to say to you this morning, you and I have a box. You and I do the very same thing to Jesus that these leaders do as well, did as well. We like to domesticate him. See, we want to bring Jesus down and make him, shape him in our image. Make him like we would like him to be. Of course, some of the most uh, common ways in which we do that is we would like Jesus to be all love and no commandments. We would like Jesus to be just the good moral teacher, someone who can direct me on the way that I should go, but not actually a savior. See, we have a box too. What is your box? a concept, an idea in which you have tried to fashion God and put him into your, what you would like him to be. And Jesus will not do it. He comes to destroy and to blow up our concepts of who he's like. So first we have to grasp that just like in Narnia, Aslan was the king, whether the children knew it about him or not, whether they had met him or not, he was king. And that's what Jesus is saying here. I am the Messiah king who has come, and I'm not just king of Israel. I am king of all, king of everyone, king of kings. Which leads us to the second matter in the psalm, and that is that Jesus comes as a priest forever. Jesus comes as a priest forever. You see, Jesus comes into Jerusalem, and he's aware of two words from his father. The first is, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. He's a king, and he will rule. To sit at the right hand of God of course, is to be elevated to the highest place in all of the universe. And it's to execute the plan and the purposes and the will of God. But the second word from the Father is very different. Look there in Psalm 110, verse 4. The Lord has sworn and he will not change his mind You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, this is an interesting feature or facet that we have to reckon with. You see, Jesus doesn't quote this portion of the psalm in his dealings with the leaders, but it's clearly on his mind because... As he is pressing the issue that he is not merely a descendant of David and that their version of the Messiah is short-sighted and inadequate to account for what the scriptures are saying. As he is pressing that issue, here is the question that arises. If, in fact, he is this elevated ruling king... And if, in fact, he's bringing a completely different kind of kingdom than David could have ever brought, how will this king rule? How will he bring about the kingdom that he is bringing? And the answer that Psalm 110 gives to that question is, he's going to be a priest. Now... When you hear that, you ought to say, what? What 
king establishes his kingdom on the foundation of being a priest. There is where we should stop and think, and what is the writer David speaking about, and what possibly could this kingdom be like? When kings come to rule, how do they come? Power, might, authority, conquering. They bring their military might to bear. They conquer their enemies. But Psalm 110 says, Come sit at my right hand and I will, you will rule over the nations. But not just that. The way in which you're going to do that is by being a priest. I should mention just a few things about priests. First of all, what is a priest anyways? I suspect that if you have a more maybe of a Catholic background, maybe you're a little bit more familiar with the concept of priest, but for more Protestant raised people, or we have a less understanding. What is a priest? Maybe a simple illustration can help. If you want to build a house, you're going to have to get certain people in order to line up in order to help you. And two people that are going to be really critical is first that architect has to do the drawings. There have to be drawings to follow. The second person that you're probably going to need to line up is a contractor that takes the drawings and then begins to implement them into reality. In other words, these two people are, have to be qualified people in order to perform the function that you need done, which is, in the end, a house to live in. You need qualified people to be ambassadors or emissaries for you to do the work that you need done. And that's just a very simple illustration of what a priest is. A priest is a person who stands between you and represents you before God. But you need a qualified priest. Thinking back about the Old Testament, there were two offices in the Old Testament that were absolutely critical. One was a king, and the other was a priest. And those two offices were distinct from one another. Kings were not priests, and priests were not kings. They were official functions, but they were kept separate from each other. The kings represented God to the people. They ruled. They led the nation. They enforced the law. They, they wielded the sword. They dealt in judgment. Priests, on the other, other hand, represented people to God. They offered the sacrifices, they presented the offerings, they taught the law, they burned the incense, they ministered in the temple. And those two roles were never to be confused. Kings were anointed to rule, and priests were anointed to represent and to minister before the Lord. They came from different tribes. Kings came from the tribe of Judah. Priests came from the tribe of Levi. And they were distinct. And do you know that there was one time in Israel's history when one of the kings tried to do both? Do you remember the story? King Uzziah became a very powerful king. And the scripture said that he got prideful and he went into the temple and he tried to burn the incense in the presence of God. And the priests who were there said, Uzziah, you don't belong in here. You have not been called to do this. You are not allowed to do this. And Uzziah boldly went in and did it anyway. And he confused those two offices. And when he did so, he became a leper. And for the rest of his days, he lived separated from the people. The question that we have to ask ourselves this morning is, we need a priest who is qualified to represent us before God. Are you qualified in and of yourself to stand in the presence of majestic holiness? Do you have the capacity in of yourself to represent yourself 
before God, before a God who is of absolute moral holiness. You see, you and I, because of our decision to kind of live, to live life our own way, to live in our own, for our own selves, have become guilty. And because of that, we can't stand in the presence of God, and therefore we need a priest, someone who is qualified. We need a qualified priest who can represent us. And you know what's very fascinating? In Psalm 110, we see something interesting. The Lord God combines these two roles, a king and a priest, into a single individual. And the question that we have to ask for ourselves is, who? Who is capable of doing these things? Who has the right to sit at the right hand of God to rule over the nations? Who is qualified to be a priest before God on behalf of others? Do you know anyone? Do you recognize what a tiny little list of candidates it is possible to find to to, uh, perform that role? What kind of resume would you have to have in order to be sitting at the right hand of God to rule and at the same time be a priest to represent other people? Do you know anyone that has that kind of resume? In all of human history, from the time of Adam to to the present day and going forward, there is no one on the planet Earth who ever possibly has the qualifications to serve in that role. Unless God himself, in the most amazing act, becoming human himself and living in the world and living in obedience to his Father day after day, can become a qualified priest who is like you, flesh and bone, blood, human, but also unlike you. No sin, no disobedience, no doing things his own way, always, always, always obeying his Father. And don't you know that the one who ruled, just how is he going to rule? And the answer to that question is that he was going to come and lay down his life. He was going to take on not just Israel's enemy, but everyone's enemy. And may I ask you this morning, do you know what your enemy is? It's not people. It's not your circumstances. It's not the situations that you find yourself in. It's not the things that you don't like. It's not the other political party. Brothers and sisters, do you know what your real enemy is? It's sin and death. That's your enemy. Everybody that's sitting in this room right now is dying. Everybody that's sitting in this room, unless the Lord Jesus comes in your lifetime, is going to die. When I sat beside Helen this week at her bedside, in the final moments of her life, Her enemy was death. Death is what is our enemy. Sin is killing us. Who's going to deal with that? And Jesus Christ came into the world to be a king, 
and not to have some political earthly kingdom, but to take on the real enemy that's in the world, and that is sin and death itself. He's not here to kick out the Romans or to kick out whatever next political party or whatever next uh, uh, earthly power there is. He's here to kick out sin and death and eradicate it out of his world. That's what he wants to get rid of, and that's what he wants to get rid of out of your life. One of the most amazing things about the triumphal entry Sunday, Palm Sunday, is that Jesus came into the city. Did he come with horses, military garb, power? Was he going to wield power? No. He came into the city and he laid power down and surrendered his life to be a priest. To be a representative for you before God. That's how he was going to conquer. That's the amazing story. And you know the teachers and leaders of Israel knew that when Jesus put that question to them, they either had to accept his claim or get rid of him. They either had to crown him or crucify him because he did not fit the mold. He wasn't going to be a Messiah that they could control. And they knew they either had to embrace him or kill him. But you know, here's the irony. The moment that they killed him, they only established him and confirmed him as the role and the role of being that priest king. And that's why Peter and his sermon and and uh, Pentecost quotes this very passage and says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Oh, the wisdom of God. And so this morning as we close, may I just say to you, Jesus comes to you in the same way that he came to those people. He comes to you as a king and he comes to you as a priest. He comes to us to offer his priestly ministry, his life for yours, his perfect record for your imperfect record, his blood in place of yours. And you know what? We have to make the exact same decision those Jewish leaders had to make on that day. Either I bow before him and draw near to him, draw near to God through him, or I have to reject him and remain outside of the kingdom that he's bringing and that he has brought. But one thing you cannot do, you cannot unseat him, for he is seated at the right hand of the majesty in heaven as a priest king forever. Last week, closed by reading Revelation 21, I'd just like for you to close your eyes and listen for a moment to the ministry of your priest if you be in Christ Jesus. Would you just hear what the word of God says? And would you not be like the Pevensey children who have forgotten the word of the, the prophetic word concerning this one who has come into the world that he might be our priest and our king? This is a faithful saying. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. He gave himself for our sins that, we might, that he might deliver us from the present evil world. It was the will of God that he should give himself for us that we might be saved. 
He gave himself that he might redeem us from the iniquity and purify a people for himself. When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. He redeemed us from the curse, being made a curse for us. Finally, he is able to save completely those who draw near to God through him because he always lives to make intercession for them. May I just say to you this morning, if you be in Christ Jesus, this is the truth about Palm Sunday. Your Lord, your Lord, David's Lord, your Lord came that he might become your forever priest. You might be struggling with something. You might be wrestling. Do you not know? Do you, have you not heard that this one came specifically to give his life for you? That's what Palm Sunday anticipated. Jesus coming into the, king, into the city as king that he might become your priest, the one who could represent you before the majesty of heaven. If you be in Christ Jesus, can you rest in that today? Can you find great joy and hope and anticipation about the glory of your future? You put your life into his life, and Hebrews says that he is able to save completely those who draw near to God through him. Maybe there's someone here today that has never understood this. You've always only thought of Jesus as a good moral teacher or only always wanted Jesus just to be love and nothing else. May I challenge you this morning to understand why he came, that he came, that he might, because he's going to be king, but he came that he might become your priest. Would you put your life into his life? And know that he saves completely those who draw near to God through him. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we bow before you. We understand, at least to a little degree, what it cost for Jesus to come. Father, for you to send your one and only Son into the world, and that Jesus might come as King who would lay down his life. Oh, that we would be able to worship at his feet. Would you help us, Lord, that as a people of God here to bow before you in praise and thanksgiving. Lord, you know every heart in this room this morning. Every concern, every matter, condition of every person. Would you apply your word to every person as is needed. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Come all you weary. Come all you weary. Come all you thirsty. Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water. Come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners. Come all you sinners. Come find his mercy, come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son to save us, whoever believes in him. We'll live forever. Bring all your failures. Bring all your failures. Bring your addictions. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. For God so loved. For God so loved the world that gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever the power of hell forever
forever defeated. The power of hell forever defeated. Now it is well. I'm walking in freedom for God so loved. God so loved the world. Sing praise God. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him, for the wonders of His love. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him. So love for God so love the world that he gave us his one and only son to save for God so love the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever power of hell forever defeated now it is well i'm walking in freedom for god so loved god so loved the world bring all your failures bring all your failures bring your addictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Amen. Amen. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Trust this morning as you've been here in the presence of the Lord together that you've experienced God's goodness, his reminders of his faithfulness, the confidence that he walks uh, with us. And that for whoever comes to him, he's able to save completely those who draw near to God through him. And that's his promise to us. So we leave you this morning, send you back into the world with a confidence that the Lord is walking with me. We want to invite you at the end of the service. I'd love for you to stick around in our fellowship time in the fellowship hall. Um, especially if you're new, we'd love to be able to connect with you. I also want to remind you of our life application groups. Uh, if you're not connected with one of those, we want to be a church that's gathering around the Word of God and discussing God's Word together that we might grow in grace. Would you receive this benediction? Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to the only wise God, be honor, glory, and praise now and forever. Go in God's peace. You're dismissed. <laughs>